Hey, what's wrong with that plane? It's flying over your head, moving in circles. Has it lost its way? Are there some problems with its navigation systems? Nah, calm down. It's just sprinkling salt over the clouds. It's called cloud seeding. Now, I know for sure rock salt is used to prevent people from slipping and cars from skidding off the road in winter. But why would we need to do it in the sky? Well, drought is a big problem in many places all over the planet. A lack of drinking water, parched soil, wilting plants, and cloud seeding could solve this problem once and for all. To put it simply, the whole process is sowing clouds with chemicals to make it snow or rain. Different stuff is used in this process. For example, bright yellow silver iodide, dry ice, and even common table salt. They mix with the clouds and thicken them. The larger the clouds are, the more likely it'll rain or snow. It goes like this. Water evaporates and rises into the atmosphere in its gas form. There, it cools down and forms into clouds. The bigger and heavier water droplets become, the sooner they fall down to Earth. Cloud seeding helps to speed up these droplets' growth. Planes either shoot the chemicals into the clouds or release them while flying nearby. Sometimes the seeding is even done from the ground. Scientists claim that when the atmosphere is clean, the chances it'll rain after some cloud seeding increase by 30 to 35 percent. If the atmosphere is dirty, though, this number is lower, just 10 to 15 percent. And still, some people are skeptical about the cloud seeding idea. They're sure this method works only on the clouds that would rain anyway. But if cloud seeding does work, lots of regions with little water or regular droughts will be literally saved. Even the driest places have some water in the air. Once you manage to pull it from there, voila! You can create rainfalls. There's another thing cloud seeding can help with, and that's hail. In some areas, a single hailstorm can cause up to $500 million in damage. That's why specially modified planes fearlessly enter storms and spray chemicals into the clouds. This reduces hailstone size. Plus, if they're in time, the planes prevent small cloud towers from growing into huge mature hailstorms. Ever noticed white trails airplanes leave in their wake? Those are called contrails. They appear when humid emissions from jet engines mix with the atmosphere. It's much colder and has lower pressure than the exhaust gases. The water vapor they contain condenses and freezes. This forms a cloud, like the one your breath makes on a cold day. Contrails can have different thicknesses. They can stay in the sky for hours or disappear after several minutes. They can stretch for miles or they can be rather short. Everything depends on the altitude and the humidity and temperature up there. Look at a contrail attentively and you might be able to predict the weather. If the contrail's thin and short-lived, the air at high altitudes is dry, it's not going to rain, and the weather's going to be just fine. But if you see a thick contrail that stays in the air for a long time, bring along your umbrella. The air is humid high above your head. It's an early sign of an upcoming storm. The average passenger aircraft reaches its cruising altitude of 6 to 7 miles in the first 10 minutes of flight. But how high a plane flies still depends on its weight and some other characteristics. For example, the famous supersonic passenger airliner Concorde. Its greatest speed was twice faster than the speed of sound, and it used to fly way higher than other modern-day planes, at 50,000 to 60,000 feet. But this plane was the exception rather than the rule. By flying at such a height, planes can avoid bad weather. High winds and heavy rains often occur in the lower layers of the atmosphere. Also, keeping to high altitudes allows planes to stay clear of heavy air traffic. For example, helicopters and light aircraft. Birds and even big insects don't bother you during the flight, too. And if an emergency happens at a height of more than 6 miles, pilots will have more time to figure out the best possible solution. Why can't commercial airliners fly higher than 38,000 feet? Well, it's not that they can't. They simply don't. Because if they did, there would be serious safety issues. First of all, if a plane is flying that high, it needs more time to get back to a safe altitude. And during an emergency, like rapid decompression, every second counts. At lower altitudes, airliners can also rely on the wind. If they rise too high, they'll waste too much fuel to stay in the air. While traveling at such a great height, planes can't communicate with the ground services as well as they do when flying lower. 
Once a plane climbs too high, the air can't provide enough lift to keep the machine going. The lift is created by the difference in air pressure, but at high altitudes, this difference is too small. Air may not look like something real because it's nothing like metal or plastic. And still, it's one of the things that keeps planes aloft. Let's say a plane is heading for space. It has large, cleverly designed wings and super powerful engines. But the higher it goes, the thinner the air becomes, until there's hardly any air left. And then nothing can help the plane go further since there is a near vacuum around. That's why we still need rockets to get to space. And finally, planes don't fly too high because they're a bit too heavy. The more a machine weighs, the more difficult it is to bring it to a certain altitude. Planes don't take off when the weather is too hot. For one thing, jet engines don't like extreme temperatures. A much bigger problem with scorching temperatures is that aircraft just can't generate enough lift to rise into the air. And, as you already know, if there's no lift, there's no flight. To generate this lift, the air around the plane should be dense enough. But the hotter the air is, the less dense it becomes. When the temperature rises, air molecules heat up and start to move faster. They're also moving apart, creating more in-between space. This results in low air density. The wings don't have enough stuff to push against, and they're unable to produce the necessary lift. The highest temperature at which a plane can take off or land depends on the aircraft, runway length, payload, and airport altitude. In most cases, it's 110 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Airplanes can fly through hurricanes, and those are less dangerous to flights than thunderstorms. But why? The most catastrophic hurricanes can travel thousands of miles, and their effects can linger for days afterwards. Most hurricanes form at a much lower altitude than thunderstorms. That's why a plane can easily fly over certain parts of a hurricane. Of course, no commercial airliner will ever go through the eyewall of a hurricane. There, the winds are the most powerful. But while flying farther away from the center of a hurricane, planes are in no danger. As for a thunderstorm, it can create gigantic cloud structures. Their tops can reach more than 60,000 feet. That's almost twice higher than the average cruising altitude of commercial airplanes. So, when an airplane comes across a thunderstorm, pilots either try to find a roundabout route or simply turn back. If possible, planes avoid flying over very high mountains like Everest. Imagine that a plane starts to lose cabin pressure while moving over the Himalayas. Maybe one of the doors was sealed incorrectly. Or there's a crack in a window or the fuselage. The passengers and crew members put on their oxygen masks. But this oxygen is going to run out in 15 to 20 minutes. At an altitude of 35,000 feet, it's a disaster. That's why pilots have to make the plane drop down to 10,000 feet. There, the passengers will be able to breathe without using oxygen masks. But the plane is still moving over the Himalayas, where many peaks are taller than 25,000 feet. In other words, the plane has nowhere to go. Another reason why planes have such an impressive cruising altitude, it allows pilots to have some room for error. If something goes wrong with the engines, the captain can glide the aircraft while trying to fix the problem. Unfortunately, even the most experienced pilot can't do much if there's a mere 6,000 feet down to the mountain slope. Let's say something happens to a plane and an emergency landing is unavoidable. Then pilots might have problems with finding an airport in the mountains. If we talk about the Himalayas, Kathmandu Airport can deal with a jet. But this place has only one runway and doesn't have an instrumental landing system. Plus, if you've ever flown over the mountains, you must know that the turbulence up there is quite nasty. Winds move over high mountain ranges at breakneck speeds and create so-called mountain waves. And while turbulence isn't dangerous per se, airlines still try to plan their routes around mountainous areas.